I'm Tracy Austin, your host of the People Strategy Podcast. This show provides interviews with organizational leaders and ongoing coaching experiences that highlight elevating people in organizations through a people strategy roadmap. I am thrilled to introduce to you today the founder of CS Recruiting, Charlie Severo, and she is a recruiter by trade and a connector by heart. And what she has done is she has brought the right people together at the right time, very specifically in the logistics, transportation, and supply chain space. And so CS Recruiting's team has helped thousands of clients and candidates come together through relevant and timely introductions that make a significant impact on both the new hires into those organizations and on the businesses that she serves. So Charlie founded CS Recruiting in 2011. And along that time, you will hear through our conversation today, she really worked in the business before she stepped in to lead the business. And that has a distinct impact on how she has set out her people strategy and the impact of values that CS Recruiting has. And I'm going to share these values with you before we jump into the conversation because they come up throughout as really that litmus test for any business decision and ensuring that employees have a great experience. So the values are to make a difference, inspire and be inspired, connect, bring people together and create to your own luck, win together. So celebrate yourself and others, be curious, explore opportunities to educate yourself and learn from mistakes and do what's right. Always trust in your gut. So I know you're going to love this conversation with Charlie as we chat about the impacts that our values have on our people strategy. Enjoy the show. What is really personal to you about the alignment of organizational values and culture with personal values? Oh, I think it's it's all personal, especially for someone who is an entrepreneur where you are creating these values that will ultimately drive your business. So I'll tell you a quick story. So I started my business 13 years ago, and there's lots of stories within those 13 years. But from a value standpoint, maybe a year in, once we started to scale and hire employees and become really official we created our first round of values. And I think I read a book and followed a guideline and we came up with like 13 words that were impactful and meant something, but they were very generic, honesty, ethics, motivation. We put each word on a little chalkboard and had it in our conference room wall. And we didn't do much about them. Like we never really tied our behavior or our decision-making back to our values. Fast forward, maybe six years into the business, we rewrote our values and we maybe scaled them down to like nine values, but it was the same mentality. And in 2020, when I really embraced this leadership position, that was number one on my list was really to create new values that felt not only personal to me, but could really guide all the decisions we made as a company, especially decisions with personnel and recruiting and retaining people. And so we put like our blood, sweat and tears into these new values. I invested a lot of my time, but really engaged my team, lots of discussions, lots of surveys, came up with five values that we truly believe in. And I can just say, like, looking back, we do live by our values. We've probably been a little over obsessed with it. When we committed to rewriting them the third time, it was like, okay, we're going we're gonna to make these official and really embrace them. But I would say any employee in my company now could recite our values. We do a lot of acknowledgement, recognition, appreciation when somebody does something that's in line with our values, every hiring decision. And then I'd say most importantly, every hard business decision, we think about our values and that's really our North Star and what guides us. So I think when we talk about the alignment between culture and values, like they are one and the same. You hire people who are aligned with your company values and they've got similar personal values. And that's that's really the beauty of how a culture forms is I don't want to say that they're like minded people because you need that diversity. But if we have one thing in common, we all believe in these five values and do our best to incorporate them in our everyday work. 
That is amazing. And I love that alignment. Do you have a story about a hard business decision that let's say you were going to make and you're like, hold on, did we run it through the values and actually you made a different decision by slowing down enough to align it to those values? Great question. I would say the one value that probably guides most of our difficult business decisions is do what's right. That's one of our values. And in the beginning of my business, do what's right was really what's right for the customer. I grew up working at Nordstrom. The customer is always right. Customer service is king. And somewhere along the way, and I think it's when I embraced leadership and really approached it with more of a a human mentality, doing what's right was more about doing what's right for our team members and knowing that if we take care of them, it's the cyclical effect and we'll take care of our customers that way. So the best example I could give was probably two years ago when we had a client that we did a lot of business with them. We had a lot of opportunity to generate revenue with them, but their ethics and values were not in line with ours. The way he spoke to people on our team, the way they spoke to candidates, since we're recruiters, we're bringing people in for jobs and getting just really odd feedback on their experience in the interview process or even some of the the experiences if they were hired and onboarded. And that's where we really sat down and thought, like, what's right here? Is it right to keep working with them even though we know that we're doing a disservice to some of these candidates because we're putting them in a company that we're not aligned with? Or is it right to protect our reputation and our ethical mentality? And that was the first client that like we really broke up with. Like I reached out and was like, I don't think our values are aligned and we're not going to continue the relationship, but I wish you the best of luck. And so that's the value, like what is right and, and who is it right for and really thinking about the priorities in those situations. Thank you so much for that and that clarity around it's not just what is right, but it's the definition of what's right based in CS recruiting, right? Exactly. Because that's those live values and those behaviors that you see over and over. So now when there's a client that comes in, you're crystal clear about what the expectations of the client are and your staff are really quick to say, hey, this one doesn't feel right because of X, Y, and Z. Exactly. And our team is aligned with our values and that value specifically. So we train them to use their intuition to feel safe to speak up if something doesn't feel right or we don't think that we're serving our clients and our candidates and our team members the right way. So I think there's a lot of factors involved. But yeah, it it's also comes down to empowering others to use their voices. That right there is a people strategy and goes into what your value proposition is to employees coming in. And that really brings me into the next question that I have for you, um, which is during this time that you've owned your organization, it started with your husband being your first employee. You've grown Mm -hmm. it to 37 employees and then your husband exited the business. So how has your job transformed during that time? A lot. And it's it's funny. I think every business owner has a different story and a different vision of where they want to be in the business. But when I started my business, I was a contributor and that's where I served the company best. It was my face. It was my name. I was out there hustling. And I think the beauty of that is because it was my company, I was going to give 150% and do whatever I needed to do to prove that we had a a service that was sustainable. But in the beginning, I was on the floor with my team. I was a recruiter. That was my title. They were recruiters. As we evolved our business, I was the first person to move into an account manager role as we created that new position, tested it out, figured out what are some reasonable metrics for someone in this position? What's the capacity look like? And for eight years, I really did that. I, I was one with my team. I led by example. I had a larger voice when it came to town halls or status meetings, but I did the work right there with them. And then in 2020 is when I really embraced a leadership position. And I will say I'm still working on it. I mean, it's really hard when you care to get out of the business. And it's that whole notion of like, I want to work on the business instead of in the business. So much easier said than done. So 
very grateful. I have a team that supports me. I have a team that's very honest with me and they can look me in the eye and say like, you are getting in our way now. So go help yourself and don't come to this meeting anymore or don't be involved in conversations on this topic. But it's something I I struggle with, but I struggle not because of control. I struggle because I care. It's like you you send me an email and I will respond and I will respond with all my heart because I'm on the email and I value that you want my opinion. So it's something that I'm just constantly trying to find that balance and figure out like what is the the real role of a founder once they're the CEO as well. Yeah, because that's a huge transition, right? And it's a personal and professional transformation. What impact did that have on the business as a whole? Yeah, on the business, I mean, it. I think the biggest impact was delegation and empowerment with other team members. That was something I learned quickly is it could be very lonely at the top. And so I recognized that maybe two years ago and really started to just appreciate the people I had around me, but also work on like investing in them and upskilling them and supporting them and knowing that the more I trusted and empowered them, the more could come off my plate and I'd be able to sleep at night. So I'd say that has had just a trickle down effect all the way down to our independent contributors. We've had this theme in the last year of just empowerment and really be accountable for your actions, but creating a safe space where you can speak up, creating a safe space where we give and receive feedback and we expect that. And I feel like a lot of that changed when I was like, wait, it's up to me to get some of this work off my plate. And that comes with not only delegation, but training, trust, support, and it it goes all the way down. So everyone in the organization feels it. What impact did that have on you personally and professionally? I think they kind of go together where for many years of my career, I harped on the things I wasn't good at. And I think that's human nature where it's like, okay, I have to do the financials. I have to read this contract, even though it drains me. And as I started to elevate my role, I really embraced this idea of like knowing my strengths and knowing, I don't want to call them weaknesses, but knowing the areas where it's very clear somebody else can do it much better than me and embracing that. And so one of the things I've learned is like, I'm an introvert. I like working by myself. That's where I get energy and creativity and ideas. I've also learned that I'm a leader, but I'm not a great manager. And so staying in my lane, making space for me to be creative, for me to create ideas, content, strategies, execution tactics. I've learned that I'm someone who's always been in the trenches, but when I actually come up for air, I do my best work if I'm really working on the things that motivate me and fill my cup versus empty my cup. So I think it's been a it's been a work in progress, but it was almost like a light bulb went off where I was like, wait, not that I don't have to do things I don't like, but if I have people on my team that enjoy that work, they have a stronger skill set or background, that's like the perfect opportunity to delegate and it helps them and it helps me. Oh my gosh, that's so good. And, you know, it's also looking at that and saying, hey, like, how would I rate myself on that? If it's less than an eight, find somebody who's a nine or a 10. <laughs> exactly. And really paying attention to like your energy levels. Like, yeah. I know that. You know, yesterday I actually had a leadership meeting and it was a six hour Zoom meeting. And I'm exhausted today. And I knew I would be exhausted today because I gave my energy and I prepared for the meeting and, you know, spoke out a lot of times. So just like knowing your tendencies and planning your week for that, that's something I realized like whenever I'm doing a speaking opportunity, it does not serve anyone for me to have five meetings in a row before that speaking event. Like clear my calendar give myself some grace and show up as my best self and just kind of figuring out like, what are those energy levers for you as an individual? Because I think a lot of times we just go through the motions until we hit a burnout. And then it's like, oh, I did that to myself. So just being very conscious and aware of your energy. Absolutely. And so often, I think we realize where energy is at based on feedback from others, right? So I had some feedback from recruiter actually this week that was like, do you realize that you kind of came across as condescending to an applicant? I'm like, no, I didn't. And thank you for telling me because I had no idea. And I went back and I looked at my calendar and I was like, okay, I had two back-to-back meetings before that interview. And I was meeting with a CEO 
client of mine immediately afterwards. Yeah, so too much on like, your mind. Which between I was like, oh my goodness. Okay. I immediately contacted my admin and was like, hey, can we just make sure, Kelly, that we've got like 15 minute buffers from now on? Because I don't ever want to show up that way. Exactly. And that feedback is such a gift. And I'm like, thank you. I didn't realize it, right? How has feedback impacted your leadership? I have always been vulnerable as a leader. And, you know, Brene Brown certainly like inspired me with the rest of the world. But I think that's just my character. Like, you know, I'll say the wrong, wrong cliche and then I'll laugh at myself and just put myself out there and be approachable. So I ask for feedback and I think I've done it enough with my team that it's no longer how can we give feedback upstream to our boss? Like that's not allowed. And it's more like I expect the feedback if they're, you know, watching me give a presentation or they hear me say something that may have rubbed someone the wrong way. Without that feedback, I can't grow. I can't be better. And so I encourage it a lot. And we work on it as a team. We train our whole team to give peer-to-peer -peer feedback, give upstream feedback when it's appropriate. Certainly downstream feedback is expected. But we use a little model that I learned from a coach. It's FBI um, when you're giving feedback. And F is feelings. V is behavior. I is impact. And it's this idea of like when you lead with your feelings, nobody can ever deny it. So I felt anxious because you said this, which led to that person feeling insecure and leading with your feelings. And that's something like we've really embraced in our culture is like, I'm not going to deny how you feel. We may want to, you know, sort through some of this feedback and understand why you feel that way or where it came from or what I can do to improve. But that's kind of how we've trained our whole team to give feedback internally and externally. That is fabulous because it's like the way we make somebody feel, they remember that. Mm -hmm. And so how have you used feedback really as a people strategy inside of your organization? We do a lot of different things with feedback, lots of different touch points. I think communication is key and different touch points with our team members, formal, informal conversations. But I'd say probably the most impactful is about two years ago, we implemented these meetings that we call employee evolution meetings. And everyone has one a year. Some people, if they're on a specific track, will have two a year. They're guided conversations where there's questions in advance that our team members are processing and answering. And then when we come to the meeting, it's their manager, someone from our executive team, and them. And we really talk and, and ask some very like thought-provoking questions like, whose job in this company interests you outside of your own? And asking them what their motivators are and how their motivators have changed as their seasons of life change. So really understanding what skills, it, most, most importantly, what soft skills they possess that we maybe haven't identified, and then also areas of opportunity. But I think it's feedback because they're sharing feedback with us about their role. Same things, like we're asking them, when you think of your day-to-day -day job, what drains you, what energizes you, how can we make that more balanced on the energized side and makes us rethink the duties with our positions, the expectations, the goals we have. But it also, it's a two-way stream where they're there to receive our feedback, our thoughts and suggestions on how they're doing, but also what the potential is for them. It's like enrolling them in the outcomes, but also really listening into what you need so you can create mm -hmm. that healing strategy with them as to where they're going. Exactly. And I think a lot of organizations, us included, we used to do it once a year during an annual review and just like blocking off this time and having one hour dedicated to just talk about your evolution, your future. It's almost like a stay interview, but it gives them, it just gives them a feeling like they're being seen, they're being heard. There's follow-ups. Like we constantly are referring back to that conversation. And, you know, two months later, I'll recommend a book or an article that came as an idea from what we talked about during that evolution meeting. So just keeping it top of mind and giving them, and when you really think about it, an hour a year is such a minimal investment that has such a, a, a huge impact in ROI at the end of the day, especially if that's their love language and they want that quality yeah. time. 
I love the five languages of appreciation. Love languages yes. at home, languages of appreciation, appreciation. at work. Exactly. <laughs> We're really big on that too. And that's another thing, just knowing I am very aware of mine and I'm very aware of the people I work closely with. So I can lean into that and you know, I'm not going to send them a gift if they just want to be heard or they just want a, a coffee chat and to catch up. So Knowing that about team members, another very easy tactical thing you can do that can make a big difference in the relationship. Yeah, absolutely. And so when we were chatting previously, you mentioned structures that were put in place during COVID meant to support staff that actually had the opposite effect of that. Mm -hmm. And I think so often we do things thinking it's a positive and realize that it's a negative through feedback or through results. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah. So probably like the rest of the world, we went home on March 13th of 2020 and we never returned to our office. We had two years left in our lease and we played that game in 2020 where it was like, okay, in September, we're going to go back, but we're going to get plexiglass. And then it was January, but we have to be six feet apart. And eventually we just realized like our quality of life was leading to more productivity, more happiness. And the commute was a strain on our team because we had an office in the suburbs and a lot of our team members lived downtown in Chicago. So we got rid of our office and it was a lot of work. We are a fully remote company. We have been since 2020. There's a lot of skeptics out there. And I think the bottom line is that it falls on management and leadership to make it work. Remote work can work, but it's not easy. And so one of the first things we did was very naive of us. And when I can look back in retrospect, I can see that, that I got a call one day from this company that really, they understood my pain points. Like I will tell you, these guys were great salespeople because they called and they're like, we're assuming that you're all of a sudden a virtual company and you're probably having anxiety about managing people and measuring metrics and the way you used to do it might not work anymore. And so they sold us this technology that was like a gamified where we programmed it on the back end that if somebody for every email, they got a point for every three clicks in our database, they got another point. And it was a point based system with a leaderboard that when we looked at it, we were like, this is really going to motivate our team. It's going to keep everyone connected and engaged and cheering for each other. And we could do some contests around team goals. And it's going to give our managers lots of visibility and transparency about what everyone's up to all day when we can't see them working. And I think we were about two weeks in using this new product and it just backfired. And it took the courage of a couple team members to speak up and be like, this is micromanagement. We've never felt this untrusted and this technology is not healthy for us. It's creating bad competition in the company. It's creating unnecessary anxiety and stress. Like, just let us do our job. And we shifted and we thankfully got out of our contract. But it was a good lesson for us because it was like, no, we just need to have organic trust. We need to hire the right people, communicate, be transparent with what our expectations are. That's the strategy for measuring productivity and knowing what people are up to versus having to track every move. So I think it could work for some businesses, but we learned the hard way that it, if we didn't cancel that technology and remove it as part of our plan, like we would have lost some valuable employees that just probably got to a point where they didn't understand the reason we did it. And if we didn't understand their pushback, we, it could have been a disaster, but I'm grateful conversations were had that led us to rethink it. And we learned a good lesson about our people and the way we manage them. And what an amazing testament both to feedback and the culture that you've built around trust mm -hmm. and the ability to have those conversations without a fear of that retribution or that pushback on it. Yeah. And it hasn't always been that way. I think it's like different, different groups of people in the organization breed different types of communication. But I think the big change was our leadership's commitment to seeing people, hearing people, making sure they felt psychologically safe to speak up and preaching that. Like we say a lot of this stuff over and over to our team to the point that they should feel comfortable. There's no consequences for speaking up if it's a message we need to hear. As we start to wrap up today, what's a takeaway that you have for our listeners, whether they're in the HR seat, whether they're in a mid-level management seat or an executive seat? I think speaking to those audiences 
my best advice is see people for who they are behind their title. You are going to hire them for skills, for background, for experience, but the more you invest in them, the more you're going to get out of them. And it's not always a financial investment. It's taking the time to know what you know drives them, to know what drains them. It's taking the time to know that if they don't look right in a meeting, there's probably something going on at home and they don't owe you all the details, but you want them to be comfortable enough to start a meeting and say, listen, my my grandma is sick and I'm very distracted today and I, I am working through it and I'll be back next week, my full self. But like how much of a difference a quick conversation like that can make because it it just creates awareness and it then allows me to support them and really show them that I care about them as a person before I care about their production, especially on a day like that. And the same thing goes, and we can't, you know, I don't want to be all woo saying this, and I, I recognize we all have capacity, but like, same thing with the barista at Starbucks, same thing with the janitor at school, like, just be kind to people and, and make eye contact and smile. And it, it can change the whole trajectory of someone's day, someone's life, just seeing them for who they are, because we just get so caught up in our professional identity and the title and the work we're supposed to do. And there's so much more to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so what's one challenge that you have for our listeners today? I am a connector and it's no coincidence that I became a recruiter. It was kind of like my second career and I never, never even knew about recruiting until I, I found it and embraced it. But when I reflect back on my life, like that's something I've always been passionate about is if I knew two people that could help each other or should know each other or could do things together, like make that introduction. And that's what I would encourage is if someone reaches out to you and you can't help them, who can? Like there's probably someone in your network and it can go a long way. So think of little opportunities to make those human connections. And it feels really good to be part of someone's story when big things happen as a result of an introduction you made. I love that because that connection is so important. And it's not just connecting the two people together, but it's the connection that you have through both of them. Exactly. Showing that you care and that you are listening. Any last thoughts that you want to share with our audience today, Charlie? I think my last thoughts are you and I are talking in a really funky market. So things that morale is down, there's a lot of fear, the economy is upside down. And so even despite hard times, like just continuing to lead with your heart, obviously, business leaders have to make tough business decisions. But I do my best to put my people first with some logic of running a business and rationality that we need to survive as a business. But anytime I can put humans first and make sure they know that I value them, I value their presence, their contributions. I think that's the best thing. Like when I think back to my early jobs, I had some bosses that really did that and impacted me and some where I felt invisible. And I think that shaped a lot of who I became as a professional while I was at that company. So that's my advice is lead with your heart, see humans for humans, treat people the way you want to be treated. I love it. And who are the who's that that you're searching for right now for your clients? So we focus in the supply chain, transportation, and logistics industry. So anyone who is in a full-time professional position, maybe looking for another opportunity, those are the job seekers we can help. And then any company that is looking to hire for roles that influence decisions around transportation, you know, freight movement, distribution, manufacturing, that's right up our alley. So we'd love to connect with some listeners if there's an opportunity on either side. Wow, that was an amazing conversation with Charlie. And I am thrilled to highlight some of the key points that jumped out to me that really create the people strategy inside of CS Recruiting and what has them be so successful in what they do for their clients and ensuring that they're creating that amazing space for their staff to thrive. And so that first thing that came out to me is 
that distinction between being a great leader and a great manager. You know, one of the things that Charlie said is, look, I'm a great leader, but I'm not a great manager. And so part of that people strategy that she talked about is knowing what my strengths are means that I'm going to align my team so that they're playing to their strengths and I am also playing to my strengths. And when we look at the people strategies that we create and as we set people strategies, as we partner with organizations, one of the key things that we're looking at is where are the individual strengths and how do we turn up those individual strengths by having the right people on the team that complement each other to execute that key business strategy. And so with Charlie having the self-awareness of she's a great leader and not a great manager, it allows her to turn up the strengths of someone else by relinquishing that control over the management piece so she can truly lead and be in that key area that she does best. The second point that really stuck out to me as a phenomenal people strategy is how Charlie utilizes feedback in the organization, specifically using FBI, feelings, behaviors, and impact. And so when we look at the feedback that we are giving to others and when we're requesting feedback from others, really looking at this idea of FBI. And I love this. This is something I hadn't heard before. So what are the feelings and the behaviors and the impact of that interaction with that other person so that we can give feedback that is impactful and drives us to where we're going? But also when we're receiving it, we can really step in and go, okay, I get how that made you feel. I get the behavior and the impact that that specifically had. And that's a key people strategy in the fact that it builds trust. And we know that the more that we trust in the others that we work with, the stronger that engagement is going to be and the stronger that relationship is going to be. And then the final point that I want to make from Charlie's conversation is when we specifically look at what's going on behind the scenes. So one of the things that Charlie stated later in our conversation was taking the time to know what is going on behind the scenes. And so as leaders, when we are working with organizations and through organizations, so often we just see what happens in the behaviors and the outcomes. And that's fantastic. However, it's what's happening behind the scenes that is creating those behaviors and those outcomes. Because a key piece of the people strategy is really taking the time to understand what employees are feeling, what they are experiencing, and what's happening behind those scenes because that drives what that engagement is. So a key people strategy is receiving feedback in a cadence inside of the organization so you as leaders can make the key observations and or changes needed in order to continue to get the business results that you're specifically looking for. So my three key takeaways from the conversation with Charlie that have an impact on the people strategy are very specifically to know what your key strengths are. So that distinction between being a great leader versus a great manager, looking at feedback and that model of FBI feelings, behavior, and impact. And then third is to really understand what's going on behind the scenes and using feedback, whether it's employee surveys or conversations to help understand what's happening so that you can course correct as needed. Thank you so much for listening today. I'd love to connect with you. If you'd like to connect, you can find me on LinkedIn at Tracy, T-R-A-C-I Austin, and at our website at elevatedtalentconsulting.com. If you'd love to learn more about our process, please reach out to us. And again, thank you so much for listening and sharing your feedback with us through a review. Have a fantastic day.